Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching this, wherever you're watching this from, welcome to the new Love Rugby League weekly set. My name is Dave Parkinson, delighted to be joined as always by the main men of Love Rugby League. Introduce yourselves, even though there might be something ending across your chest at some point soon. Drew Derbyshire, Drew Derbyshire. <laughs> yeah. James Keith, this is James Gordon by the way, he turns up whenever he... When he, whenever he feels like it, he keeps promising us Busy, a backboard man. as well, but that's yeah, not turned we'll up. He, pro- he we've, got a new, we've got a new sofa and a new chair and he a made, new table, so we're he getting made there. The, he made this promise in January. Oh, we'll have a backboard, <laughs> get, get him one drawn up. False promises. Ed Ev. Are you? How are you I'm, doing? I'm James Gordon, thanks for <laughs> that, Drew. Yeah. Okay. How are you doing anyway? Good, good. Uh, we've reached that stage of the season where it's all internationals. Um, your thoughts on the international that you saw at the weekend? Good. It was uh, full of full of talent on show. Oliver Gilda. It was good to see him make his debut. Not only make his debut though, scored a sensational try. Uh, New Zealand are a much better side than than what England faced in Denver. I think that's pretty fair to say. Dalian Watine is a Lesniak at fullback. I love watching him. I think he's a fantastic player for New Zealand. He had a bit of an ongoing, uh, shall we say, discussion point. Yeah, with the referee. Did. But I don't think it was quite Josh McCrum, was it? I think it, I think the. Uh, Watini Zelezniak was actually having a little bit of banter it was, it was kind of enjoying it with it, with Robert Hicks but um, yeah he's a fantastic player to watch but England marginally just de- deserved the, the win I think um, I know because of issues we didn't quite get our selections did we from the other week up which we were talking about for the England team um, so therefore none of you all know what we selected but I did go with Sam Tonkins at halfback didn't I and he started at halfback you did and uh, I think he, he went well there and I think he was never not going to go well there to be honest because I think Sam Tompkins always just provides that little bit of reliability um, and, and that's what he did. Jake Connor was in, in the centre role. I was quite surprised at that, to be fair. I thought he might get the, the nod at half back. Um, but Wayne Bennett clearly likes Jake Connor. He, think, he thinks he's a special player. He said that to the press. Uh, and he went pretty well. His defence were a little bit poor at times. I thought in the centre role, he kept opening his right shoulder. Um, but yeah, uh, a solid performance from England. We had, we had a talk about this last week, and I predicted that Connor would play centre, and Drew was adamant he'd be playing at half back. So that was a, a rare moral victory for me in the uh, in Love Rugby League office. But uh, 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 I think I mean it, it's interesting that obviously Connor got the nod over over Percival. Mm. Um, it was good that Bateman obviously played in the back row, and you could see that from you know for Gildart's try. Obviously, that's what you know. I guess uh, you know Bateman's a great player, but he's not quite got that pace that some of the other outside backs have got and you saw a fine example of what can happen when a back row gets an offload out to a, to a quick centre and you know he was off it was a great try it was a great tackle attempt by the full back you were just talking about but yeah. I mean blistering, blisteringly quick wasn't it Gildart's break from, from where it was I mean you know, I know, I knew he was. You know, obviously we know he's a good player, and um, you know he's quick. But I mean, he, he showed some great wheels there. So, um, one thing that I do want to ask you about, I didn't think it quite worked for England at halfback. Did you not? No, uh, I'm thinking we Tompkins. I thought had a great game. I think that George Williams though, he disappointed me. Because I, I, I think I, yeah, I think he needs to be playing regularly, uh, and, and I know obviously he's he's been in it. In and around the England squad for the last one, well, two years or so now. It was uh, it was at the World Cup. Barely played. I think he played was it around about twenty minutes against France or something. Uh, so I just think he needs to to play more, and uh, I think he needs to be trusted in the halfback role because that's what that's what Sean Wayne did with him at Wigan. If you remember him bursting on the scene at Wigan, he didn't set the world alight at the start. Um, he, he primarily came off the bench, but Sean Wayne gave him that number uh, six year after his breakthrough season and uh, look what he's done I just think he needs I think he, he lacks that little bit of confidence at times I think he needs believing himself a little bit more George because he's got a fantastic running game and when he steps off, off that left and uh, catches the defence off guard we need to see more of that Is that a fantastic running game at club level though? There's I mean, a difference because you don't get as many opportunities at international I mean it's the, it's the age old problem isn't it with halfbacks for England I mean we always seem to have the discussion you know obviously going back to even when Rangi Chase was was around there was always the debate well who's the start in six or seven and while you look at maybe some of the other positions that players have maybe 
locked down. Um, halfback still one that's open. I mean, Tomkins for me. I mean, I think he's very. I think his achievements this year are very understated. I think mm. if you look at a year ago, Tomkins was you know didn't get in the World Cup squad, and for him to basically have you know turned it around, he was he was in great form for Wigan all season. To get back into the England England squad is um, you know and play as he has. I think is a, a real testament to him. I mean, he get you know he's the sort of he's a player that obviously a lot of other clubs fans love to hate. But you've got to you know he's not. I mean, he, you know, obviously he's a very talented player, but he's probably not. He's probably not the most. He's not. He's probably not the most naturally gifted player there is. But the fact that he works hard and his mentality is right actually gets him over. He was the one that was you know at the start. You know, he went and played for the Barbarians of Rugby Union. He was the one who was trying to create profile for himself, and and people seem to. Like envy or or, or criticise him for that when actually rugby league needs more play, rugby league needs more players like Sam Tompkins who believe in themselves who who want to push them to that next level both on and off on and off the field. I think he's got to play, hasn't he? I, I, I don't think there's there's any there's no point in just resting him. Uh, I think he's got to he's got to play. Um, yeah, it, I think and I think if it, he likes Johnny Lomax being in the fullback spot, does does Wayne Bennett? So I think Johnny Lomax has got that spot nailed down. I don't think Rashford's go, going to play this series if I'm honest. I think a, Tompkins a, has to start in the halves, and obviously a discussion can be had about George Williams or Jake Connor going in the halves or. Uh, even Richie Myler. It's a bit of a weird sport. one though because you know if you look at you know Lomax is obviously playing scrum half every week for St Helens and probably will do next year because they've got Coot and Nike Armour who probably have the full back jersey ahead of him anyway. You've got Tomkins but plays, I, 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 Tomkins I, I, plays full back for Wigan and then you know by and large the yeah. majority of his career played played full back at w- Wigan and you've got. Is that what's is that not helping George Williams because he's effectively putting George Williams in as your sort of your bona fide standoff against Tompkins who's basically just playing scrum half because they don't want to pick him at fullback and then you've got Lomax who usually plays scrum half playing at fullback then you've got Ratchford who's probably one of the most consistent players in the old Super League sat twiddling his thumbs. I think he's naturally gifted as well is is Ratchford. Yeah, you just yeah. look at he's such a balanced runner. He's good with everything that he does. Isn't the, he? The, sp- the span that, that I'd have if, if I was Wayne Bennett, I'd, I, because I think Johnny Lomax is better at uh, half back than he is at full back. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd put Johnny Lomax into the half. I'll put Sam Tompkins at full back, uh, and I'd be tempted to keep George Williams in just because defensively as well at international level, I think he's the best defensive half. We we. I've got and I think I think the key point here is that it, it shouldn't be about what's best for Johnny Lomax it should be best about what's best for balance in the whole team and I think while you might look at Johnny Lomax and think his best position might be full back is that what's best for the England team and I'd probably argue at the moment that it, that it possibly isn't um, I'm a massive fan of Axford and I think you know I think it's a travesty really that he's not been you know, for me, he's probably in the top five players in Super League, but he never gets the sort of plaudits and recognition. And that's maybe just because he's a player that keeps his head down and works hard. He obviously had that utility tag at the start of his career that he sort of grown out of at Warrington. Whether fullback was his best position, because I probably would have had him as, you know, as a standoff. But we've suddenly um, got tons of standoffs, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's like you know, you look at you know, you look at when no, you look not. at when Ratch- you like you look at when Salford had Ratchford and Myler, and then Warrington had Ratchford and Myler. I mean, when they were sort of at their you know, coming through, you thought, oh, well, they could probably be the top six or seven for for a long period, and it's not quite worked out like that. So, I think that's one of the. I mean, especially because the international, there's not many internationals as we know, so it's very difficult for for half backs to build a relationship and you know chopping and changing. You know, you're only playing what they, they, they played the France game, they played the three tests against New Zealand now, and they played the one in the in the summer. I mean, I'd imagine they probably end up having played five different half back partnerships by the end of it, probably. Yeah. Um. One thing that impressed me though was the, the the pack. Quite often we've heard that the England pack is one of the top packs in the world. I think they're showing that on a consistent basis now. Yeah, that, that, I think that's been the case for a few years. To be honest, I know, I know everyone talks about the size of the Kiwis and the size of the Tongans, but I think the the best England have got the best pack in the world. I think it's better than the Australians. I honestly do. Um, the, the Burgess boys came in. We knew they were going to, to do a great job. George, How good was Tom? Yeah, to, Tom was brilliant. But I think George has come back and he, he looks a so, really mo, a much more accomplished player. Didn't the, seem the to get much was. game time though, the week. No, he didn't. But I think uh, his fitness work might have been lacking a little bit. I think that that might have been a reason why. Uh, Chris Hill for me. He always, 
when it, whenever he plays for Warrington, he always stands out, and, and I know he's got a lot of stick this year, and people call him a grub and so, so on. But I, he always stands out for me, Chris Hill. He always works. He's his absolute best, doesn't he? He leaves everything on the field. I just think he's um, as he's getting older, he's getting a bit more touchy because I mean he's thirty one this weekend. Mm. And, and looking at the back rows as well, um, Elliot Whitehead. Probably the best rower, the the best bat rower in the world at the minute. Would you um, agree with that, James? And and John Bateman as well, who's who's been sensational this year in Super League. Yeah, I mean, I mean the pack the pack's been pretty strong for quite a few years, and we have got a lot of strength in depth. I don't think that's I don't think that's really up for debate. I think um, the biggest issue, as al- as has always seemingly been the case with with England teams, is is the is the half backs and the outside backs because I think. You know, you look at Australia and the size, and you know the Kiwis, and whatever the size of their outside backs compared to sort of the the English equivalents. There's always been a bit of a disparity there, and I think that's maybe where Percival's perhaps struggling to get to get in the team no, because, because if you, if his, you look, his defense his defense isn't as strong. No, you can't, you can't say that because Percival's bigger than Connor. No, I understand, no, I understand that, but I think Connor's. I think you'd probably. I think Connor's probably a better tackler than Percival is. But, but regardless of whether it's Percival, Connor, or Gildart, I think if you compare, if you stand them players up next to who Australia might have in the centres or New Zealand mm. having the centres, there's usually there's, a beast there's usually, two. Oh, yeah. Because I think, I think, Luke I think, and I think Ken it all, Marmel, the, Yeah, the and I think, I think it all. I think, I think, I think it's because the English game we seem to try and. Turn the back, ro- turn centres into back rowers. You know, I, I think I've said this before. Like when Gareth Ellis was coming through as a centre, and then he got morphed into a back rower, which may or may not have been the right thing to do. Obviously, had a really good career, and I think there's a, almost a bit of a habit that that's, you know, that that's happened with 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 players. There's a bit of a the English game is perhaps not as defined between centre and second rowers, and so it's quite easy to. You know, push your centre into the second row. Do you know what I mean? Never so, worked with Mick Nanning though. They often tried sticking Mick Nanning in at uh, well, second row, well, and I he mean. ended up morphing back out to the centre. Well, well, the thing is with Mick Nanning as an example was that you know he, he used to score at full at centre, and, and everyone used to hate playing against him. And it's like, well, why would you want to move him from your dangers? Because realistically, your centre and your wingers, if you're playing the right kind of rugby, they're the ones who were you know like Gildart did at the weekend. They're the ones that are going to break the games for you. Um, and so you know, I think I think that's always been the slight problem. Them from you know maybe that's why they tried Bateman out there quite just, a bit last just year. Just a, a quick word: Oliver Gildas obviously made his debut, didn't he, at mm-hmm. centre? But he wasn't even in, in the England squad until Sam Burgess pulled out this uh, is true. through injury. It was uh, the centres were originally Matt Percival and Reese Lynn. Uh, Reese Lynn obviously made his test debut against France the week before. So what's your thinking behind that? Why, why did Gildart get over Lynn and uh, Percival, who was originally picked in the squad uh, ahead of him? Well, you, I mean, you mean you don't know what happens at training. They might have done some set plays that that worked. I think you know it might depend on you know obviously Percival plays over on the left side, doesn't he? So maybe that that. That came into into the thinking, you know, whatever. Yeah, well, Gildart's favourites is the the left side. I think I think he's just impressed. I think yeah. he's gone in. He's been like a breath and, of and, fresh and air. Obviously, and obviously, and obviously, got the, There's just something about personal that, that Wayne Bennett Wayne Bennett doesn't fancy. Whatever. But, that but the, there's obviously something that Wayne Bennett does fancy as well in uh, in it. Mark Percival. Well, yeah, but he, I think he's, he can, he's always he's always picked Mark Percival. But he's always in the he's, squad. But that's because you know you, you've got he's one of the best English centres in the comp, and I think there'd be a bit of a. If he didn't get picked, there'd be a bit, there'd be a few more questions. Whereas I think he can sort of, if he picks him in the squad and then picks him and doesn't pick him in the team, there's a lot less sort of controversy about that than he would if he didn't. Because I mean, if you didn't pick Percival, who else would you pick? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I think you know, yeah, you know, that might change. You know, I don't know. Um, it might be. It's all about combinations as well, because you know, as much as Percival might be the best centre. Mm. When playing for St. Helens, he might not suit playing outside whoever England have at half or he might not suit playing inside whoever England have got on the wing. Just switching the coin for a second, was you a little bit disappointed with New Zealand? Because they had the chances, didn't they? I mean, they peppered that England line I the last sort of 10, 15 yeah, minutes. I, I still think they're, they're getting used to this, the new set players, what Michael Maguire's brought in, to be honest. And I think you could tell, like, they, they didn't. They, sometimes they looked gel and then other times they, they didn't look like they, no one knew what, what each other were doing and they just looked a, a little bit disjointed uh, I think their pack did very well against England England's got over them a, a, at times but I think they struck well um, but it's it's the it was the outside, it was the outside players it wasn't it for for New Zealand where they tended to struggle mm. when the, when the ball went out wide the two centres who both have big years in the mm. NRL. Um, 
a quiet games really, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did it. And but but when the ball got out to them and they, and they ran at the England line, they troubled England. But the ball wasn't spread out enough. And we speak about this all the time. It's the distribution, isn't it, from the halfbacks? The halfbacks. So do we then? So okay, I've got had a, a little bit of a, a, a maybe a bit of a. Not a goal, but a bit of a debate about George Williams. Are you saying that Nick Arima and uh, Sean Johnson haven't quite clicked together? Yeah, I've, well, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say so. And, and it, because Nick Arima's not played an awful lot for New Zealand so far in his mm. career, has he? Whereas Johnson's been the main man for uh, ten, five years. Ten, years hasn't well, it? yeah, yeah, near enough ten years now. Um, Nick Arima's not played an awful lot, so I think they're still getting used to each other. It's all about developing an half-back combination. If you look at title winning sides, their halfback combination who have played together throughout the whole year near enough and uh, that's what happened uh, with Wigan this year and that's what happens regularly anyway so um, I, th- I just think it, the more Nick Arima gets used to playing alongside Johnson and playing alongside his New Zealand teammates then the better they will be for it but going back to the the size of the centres Ken Marmolo and Essen Masters if you compare them to the English centres size wise it's it's ridiculous isn't it they could play back row in Super League mm. uh, without a doubt um, so I think uh, if they can target the the wider areas against England in the next test then they could possibly trouble Wayne Bennett's side now, I really enjoyed watching that test match. It was good to see, uh, uh, if you like, an old traditional arm wrestle in a lot of respects. Mm. And um, it, a, a lot for a lot of that game, I thought that the kicking game was going to be very, very important. And we all know what happened. Snatch and grab. It's probably a piece of footage that should be featured on every bit of rugby league promotion from here on in for the next two or three years, I think. That's right. But it probably won't be. I want to go with her, but only very briefly, if I may, um, because obviously they took this test match to Hull. 17,000, not a bad attendance, but 6,000 down on the previous time that they played there. What do you put this down to? To be honest, to be honest Eva, it was questionable if there were 17,000 in the ground because the top tier weren't even open. It only holds 25,000. The top tier weren't open at all, and there were plenty of. Um, empty seats in the lower tier so I I think that that (coughs) that figure might have been uh, bumped up a little I think the problem you've got I think one of the main problems is England just seems to play New Zealand all the time so so it's opponent fatigue I'm not not saying that that's the only reason but I mean realistically there's only three there's two maybe three countries in the world that realistically England should be given a game so that's Australia, New Zealand and maybe Tonga Australia aren't interested for whatever reason Tonga probably don't have the funds to come over here so you basically Australia don't want to play internationals because they pay the players too much and they can't afford it that's what it is they they pay the players uh, 20,000 per test match um, and they've had, we've seen it this autumn. They, they had to take a dram- dramatic pay cut to five thousand just so they could play Tonga. They don't want to play test matches unless it's a major tournament because they can't afford yeah, to, play, I, to pay the players. So I, I, and I, so I think that's one of the issues is that you know rugby league's a small world anyway. There's only you know because people it's been proven that people aren't interested in watching England pump France or pump Wales. People aren't interested in watching that because well, why would you? Um, People would turn out to watch New Zealand and Australia, but the problem is at the moment it's just New Zealand all the time because mm. Australia aren't coming over. So I mean, I, I mean, if you look back even within the last ten years, when the Tri Nations and the Four Nations were doing well, they, they seem to be doing when the Tri Nations was Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, it was really good, <laughs> and people did turn out for that. And you know why it's being moved away from that is, is I'm not sure. Is I think there an I argument wasn't... for bringing Great Britain back then? I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think Great Britain could. How can, how can it be brought back? Because it, it's no different. With, without anyway, disrespect to the other nations, apart honest. from England, from Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, how many players from them teams? Yeah, but generally, how often it, would they make it into a Great Britain team? Well, no, I'm a little bit. No, I mean, we're so uh, split uh, uh, really because. How, how many of them players were making into it? Into it's just the, the, the argument. I mean, obviously, it's all about funding, and the reason why it's there is because of finances. The argument is. If it was Great Britain versus New Zealand mm-hmm. instead of England versus New Zealand, would more people go? Because it'd, it'd be basically be the exact same team. So would are you, if it, so if it was Great Britain New Zealand last Saturday, would there have been twenty four thousand there, or would there have been seventeen? I don't know. I think. It, Could you have sold it though in the fact that you know people from Wales might have gone? Well, up there? I, I mean, I, I, think Wales, I think there's a value. I think, oh, I, I, think, think I think we're wishing that. I, I think there's a value that in the 
in the Great Britain brand the other sports that you know there's no Great Britain football team mm -hmm. you know you've got the British Lions and Rugby Union that's every four years why couldn't you have why couldn't you go back to Great Britain and then rebrand almost the the league and be the British Rugby League and you know and make it a bit you know it sounds a bit Brexit and all that but you know what I mean I think that's a brand that Rugby League could jump on Brit, you know British Rugby because there is no British rugby in rugby union because it's all English, Welsh, Ireland, separate, and they've genuinely got that. Whereas, okay, yeah, we've got national teams in Scotland and Ireland, but how big is the footprint in rugby? Uh, how big is the rugby league footprint in them countries? Realistically, you know, no disrespect to those countries because obviously the work that the people there do is great. But let's be realistic here on a commercial and a competitive stance. There's not. There's not a huge footprint there, so I mean, I wasn't. I mean, the crowd was all right. I wasn't. I'd rather, and I've said this on Twitter. I mean, I don't know whether there was any discount tickets, but I'd rather have seventeen thousand paying full price than have it sold out and people paying half price. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I think that's one of the issues that we have is that they've been so desperate to get full stadiums that you've been basically being given chucking tickets away. And I think what you're better off doing is if you get if you ever got seventeen thousand paying thirty quid to go, then next year you've got a challenge. You know, you could say, right, well, next year we're going to aim for 20,000, 20,000. It's not giving away 25,000 at a tenner because you're not getting anywhere then. Do you think some of it comes down as well to the emphasis that is placed on the club game? Because let's face it, rugby league has always classed its club game above its international. But that's well, just why, not, why not? Why not? If we're on about getting cr bigger crowds in, why not let the clubs? Help sell international tickets as well. Well, why aren't the clubs doing that anyway? I mean, there's a bit of a divide now, isn't there, because of the Super League RFL thing? But I mean, even when it was all under one roof, the clubs weren't great. But I just think there's a little bit of fatigue. I think. I mean, I sort of feel it. I think, a little, I think there was I, only three three club owners actually at the game. On but the, there's a little bit of a fatigue though, because if you Saturday. think right, the the you know the clubs come back in November for pre season. They've got the pre season game in December. Then they're basically playing games from January through to October. And it's like, you know, we're the same. You know, we cover games and we watch games. And it's like you get to this time of year and you're a bit like, we could do with a bit of a break. And it's like the internationals are just tagged on to the end of the season. I get where you're coming from. Whereas, I, you know, I, I know you're shaking your head here, Drew, but I, I certainly agree to a certain extent with James. Cause, I mean, I see a lot of rugby league. I love rugby league as much, well, probably more than the average person. I see a lot, a lot of games. I'll be seeing a few more over the next few weeks in uh, hopefully warmer climes, but that can not be guaranteed. Um, but this said... Uh, yeah, I'm feeling it as well. Because if you think, like, I know what you're saying about the clubs, but the chances are that the majority of club staff are now having two or three weeks off because they can't have any time off during the season because they're so busy. And I think that's more of a, an indication, you know, whether there's an argument that can we have a proper international window in the middle of the season? I know we had that one-off game. You know, is there an argument for maybe having a couple of games in a block in the middle of the season or something, I don't know. I mean, well, if, you scrap, if you scrap Magic Weekend, then you've, you've got a free weekend there, right? You have got a weekend. Yeah. yeah. I'm I mean, up for I, that one. I, you know, the, obviously the big issue... And, you, it, the stops, big issue, and it stops uh, people getting on for draws as well in Magic the, Weekend, the big, getting on for points and going to the top of the league. So. The big issue... Let's, let's scrap the additional fixtures that Super League oh, talks God, about as well. The, there you the, go, you the, have a proper... The, the big issue with it is that... England are the only team in the Northern Hemisphere that we can compete against. Like England are the only team. Yeah. And the issue you've got is if we have an international window, whenever you have it, if it's May June, you've got you've either got to fly to Australia or similar, or someone from there has got to fly over here. And the problem is, is because all the money's in the club game. You know, are the clubs going to really? You know, obviously we had all that fuss with Denver in, in, in the middle of the year, and it's like, I think. The whole Catalan project was designed to make France a bit more competitive so that England could play France a few times in the summer, like Australia play New Zealand rather than... I, th I think England will end up playing, playing France in a mid-season test. <laughs> but, but, then, but, there's, but, we, but it's been proven that people aren't interested Didn't in that. Didn't learn anything from it either. Because cause France aren't competitive. If anything, they're even less competitive now than they were 10 years ago. And obviously the fans aren't coming out for it because it's not really big up and... Um, that, Dep that's depends, a major it depends if the if the the French players can be bothered um, playing. Well, no, cause I, I mean it's not Fran it's not their fault per se, but I think you know England are considerably better than France, I would say. But when you when you've got the the championship player of the year not playing for f his country, well, yeah, then. but he, yeah, but he's the yeah, championship. But he's, Australian. he's the championship player. Well, yeah, he's Australian <laughs> and he's the championship player of the year. He's not. 
Sam Tompkins, is he? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I think... Yeah, but he's one of their better players. Yeah, but I think England is still considerably better than France, even if he played. Um, and I think, you know, the exit, you know, tried the Exiles thing, and, you know, and that, that was all right. I didn't mind the Exiles so much. Yeah, but no, um, no one got behind it. It's, I, I, well, wrote, I wrote, let's see, this fact, the, the five things article on loverubbelieve.com the other day, I wrote that, my, yeah, it's... it's we all know that marketing needs to be done in, a, in rugby league. There's no doubt about it. The promotion work needs to improve. But fans of our beloved game, the so-called diehards and everything, 1.5 million was a peak viewing figure for BBC mm-hmm. on, on Saturday for that England-New Zealand game. And I'm not saying 1.5 million diehard rugby league fans would have watched it. But say, say um, 100,000 rugby, diehard rugby league fans in this country watched it, why couldn't they... Why couldn't they go to the game? And, and a, a lot of a lot of people would have been in Leeds, or a lot of people would have been in Rosfield, or or the outer of areas. There, there would have been so many people in the Heartland areas of rugby league, Lancashire and Yorkshire, Cumbria, wherever. Everyone would have been loads of a lot of people. Thousands would have been watching that game on, on BBC One on Saturday. Why couldn't they turn up to the game? There's no point in bagging the RFL at every op- opportunity, saying um, or the, the they don't do anything. The the, the promotion. Well, if you, if you they all effort, I think effort, everyone, everyone effort's knew. required both Eff- ways. They've got to turn up to the game if, and, and support the beloved, the beloved uh, national team, the beloved side. If you follow rugby league, you knew that that, that test series was happening. It's not. Oh, and it's, it's like in the pe- calendar for yeah. twelve months. Yeah, and it's it? like people sit there and moan about the lack of marketing, and it's like, well, the R, the RFL, they wouldn't need to do any marketing if the people who knew about it went the yeah. game. Um, I'm conscious that I don't want this to turn into a backing session because um, we did have two other England sides which played at the weekend and I'm conscious that we're running towards time so I did want to mention uh, the performance of the England Knights over in Ley in uh, Papua New Guinea first of all what a stadium did you see the pictures it was it was like in a cage wasn't it that, yeah, brilliant <laughs> it, was, it, was, is that? it was like mesh cage you know way around the, the pitch but uh, I, I watched the highlights obviously we couldn't watch the, the full game but I watched the highlights um, I want the barbecue corned beef man yeah <laughs> that was on the, on the highlights it, it, really, it, it, looked, it looked a fantastic atmosphere it always does in Papua New Guinea doesn't it uh, it's, it's definitely on the, the bucket list for me to, to go over and witness a game hopefully in a, in a World Cup or something like that and a, a good performance from the night fair play to them England boys as well because I mean it was 36 degrees at times yeah there? There, was an, there was an interesting picture was it um I can't think who it was who was lining up the conversion and all the Papua New Guinea lads were stood right at the corner post because that was in the shade and they were all st- instead of standing under the sticks they were all stood in this little strip of the pitch next to the corner flag which was uh, which was quite funny so if it was up for them it must have been up for the uh, mm, go, go for the lads. go for the Ferdinand fans as well getting getting chance to see a couple Watson of early Boas. signings yeah, yeah Watson and Asi Boas uh, for the Cummels uh, Asi did uh, play didn't he? Did, did, well, oh, did, well in, did Wellington play? Wellington played, yeah. Wellington played. So you yeah, had a bit of a, a bit of witness representation on the international yeah. scene. It's, it's always good to, to watch the Cummels, I think, and Nanny McDonald as well, St George of the Warriors. I mean, it's, uh, uh, star. It's, it's, it's really interesting because it sounds daft, but the England Knights would probably get more. I think more fans would probably watch England Knights than, Papu, uh, than, sorry, than the full England team. I know that sounds really daft because the England Knights are in more competitive matches. Mm. You know, if you put England Knights against France, it'd be more competitive oh. than if you put England against France. Just touching on the match, why, why not have a d- double header then next year? Have, have England Knights playing um, France, for example? Well, they did that before that, the 2013 yeah. World Cup, didn't yeah, when England did, lost yeah. to Italy. But I, I think no one mentions that I, anymore. I, I, I think uh, people will get behind it. I think um, England Knights, for example, play France or p- play PNG over here. Um, what about well, everyone goes on about the Tonga last year yeah. and, and the sense. Fiji also reached the semi-finals. Fiji had a fantastic. Um, you're going there in a couple of weeks, Dave. But I have one thing to do before because I realise that we are running out of time. But in, in, being the, be the, the timekeeper, I'm going to stop the stopwatch. Go on, yeah. in, in, there in, you go. Just in, England to play Fiji in Rochdale. Get pack, pack the Crown Hall Arena out and uh, have England Knights to play uh, France before. You've done a bit of thinking about this, haven't you, Drew? I can tell the steam coming out of your ears for starters. <laughs> <laughs> Can you feel shot like a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> the ping the light bulb. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, let's do it. Well, why not? But get 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 Fiji involved. Uh, I want to I want to hear them hymns again. I I would look. Well, I mean, this is one of the things that I'm 
particularly looking forward to going over there and sampling the culture. Uh, I've already been practicing some of my Fijian, so if I say Vinaka, it, I'm not insulting anybody, it's thank you that in Fijian. Right. Sounds angry that, doesn't it? Vinaka. Vinaka. Bula Bula. Hello. Bula Bula. Hmm. What's, what's lobby in Fiji? Uh, <laughs> I've not got that far yet. I've not got that far yet. Although they do do something with a monkfish or something. <laughs> so I'm going to try it yet. anyway. This is what, what it is. Anyway. It's going to be uh, a good trip for you, Dave. Moving on, another thing that I wanted to discuss was the uh, England women's team had a resounding victory against France. It also seems that France aren't competitive in England's <laughs> women's rugby as well. We, um, we, wa- we were watching a bit of this, weren't we, in the office on whatever day it was yeah. this week. Um, yeah, it's on YouTube if you want to. Yeah, if you want to get it. Yeah, England were it. England just looked. England just looked. Um, I don't know, like they were just set up a bit better. You know, like the plays they were set up a bit more play wise. I don't know whether that's just because they've got better technical ability players or whether it's a coaching thing. I don't know. Um, this is a pretty new squad that's been. Yeah. I mean, I know the, there is some experience in it still, but there's so Georgia Roach, the, the first woman of steel as well. She's been shortlisted for the woman's golden boot as well. Two um, tries she scored in this game. She set up tries. a couple of. We were we were sort of we were we were watching the game and analysing it a little bit just to see what where we felt differences were with sort of the men's game or or whatever. And you could sort of uh, Roach's sort of passing was sort of on another level to anybody else on the pitch really you know, the way interesting because she's played uh, quite a bit of loose forward really she's only 18 as well and yeah. She is, yeah she's only just turned 18 yeah so I think we noticed that a little bit she seemed a bit more I mean I don't want to like sort of compare the women's game to the men's game but she she sort of carried the ball to the line and was looking for passes that you probably see more of in the men's game she had a bit more urgency to it yeah, whereas, to whereas some of the some of the other passing you saw during the game was maybe a little looser what, what um, do you make of uh, Tara Stanley because I was really impressed with her when I saw her in the Challenge Cup semi final uh, sorry in the Super League semi final yeah there's, there's quite a few to be fair there there's Tara Stanley uh, is it is Caitlin Beaver scored it, a couple of tries as well she's only young is it Green Shields? Yeah, yeah. The the Wigan winger, I think. Rebecca Greenfield. Greenfield, not Gr- Green Shields. It's yeah, Green, Green Shields are stamps. Uh. Yeah, but there's a, to, be, to be fair, when I was watching the game the other day, it, it was the the first like full England women game I, I've watched. Um, but it was it was good. It, but, it made for good viewing, to be yeah. honest. And there's a few good, few nice tries scored. Obviously. England and the likes of France, etc., are, are, are quite a way off Australia and New Zealand in terms of the women's game. Like we, we, we've seen recently that the, the New Zealand, the, the Gillaroos and the Kiwi Ferns were paid at three thousand each for a Test match, and that's sensational, isn't it? Really, when when you're comparing that to the to the women's women's game over here, because when it's at clubs over here, the club women game. Uh, it's more of like a community based uh, project at the minute but it's good that the Women's Super League have got on board obviously this year and uh, the women's game is growing um, slowly but surely so hopefully it's not. It's only a matter of time before the England women can catch up with the, the Australians and the, the New Zealanders I think, um, I mean I watched I went, I watched England women beat France women about 10 years ago in Toulouse because right, okay. they played it before um, Toulouse witness one year uh, and I think England women are going to have the same problem as England men. It's like they've got there's no competitive team within that's close enough to push them. Mm-hmm. And this is a big problem that rugby league's got is that you know Australia and New Zealand have got each other, whereas England are just sort of here on their own. And it's like, what can you do to sort of bridge bridge that gap? Because France are ultimately the closest nation, I suppose, to to either in men and, and women, and they're really behind where England are so I think that's the concern about you know the growth of international rugby league is you need to find we need to somehow figure out how we can get France to act well either France to be more competitive or or somebody else I bring mean, back a league versus union England rugby union women England rugby league women I just, it, you know I think and that, I honestly think that's one of the big problems now because you know there's not realistically in the north you know in Europe, there's only really France of note who are playing the game. I know obviously there's all these other nations that are playing internationals, but they're all sort of amateur sort of teams. And I think that's the big the big thing. It's all right wanting to push international rugby league, but if England haven't got anyone competitive to play against, apart from Australia and New Zealand, how, how are you going to do that? Because I think the crowds are already showing that people are getting a bit fed up of watching England New Zealand. Interesting thoughts, interesting thoughts. Finally, before we uh, we go, um, Anfield this weekend. 
how fantastic is it to take a game back to Anfield? I'm really looking forward to. It. I've I've never I've been to Anfield before, but for a fo- obviously a football game. So I've, I've never been for to to watch rugby league in Anfield. So I'm really excited for myself to go and witness it. Hopefully we we get over 20, 25,000 which which Ralph Rimmer is uh, kind of hoping for. I think. Was that a bit um, of a conservative guesstimate from Ralph? Do you I don't think, know. James? I think it's uh, to to just put uh, just to just say like oh we'll be all right we'll be, if we get twenty five thousand. I think that's a little bit below expectation for for, for as a fan looking on. I think we we need to be aiming higher in the bracket. I think we need to. Wow, and what does Anfield owe? Is it forty five thousand? Fifty four thousand. All for all year because it's got yeah, extended, it's hasn't it? Yeah. Why, why not? Why not aim for to get forty thousand in there? Then? I, I thought you did well though, because you you, you was uh, you didn't move your lips and uh, Drew was talking. Yeah, well, I did, yeah. Did he yeah. actually aim um, at you to be honest. Yeah, they, I think um, I don't know. I, 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 I think we just get a bit too caught up on the crowd sometimes. I you know I know people are on about oh let's play it here there and wherever. Um, yeah, I'm just obviously I know the football ground thing. Causes problems with the schedule. Why couldn't they just play it? if they're only going to get twenty five thousand? Why can't they just play it at Wigan or Huddersfield? Play it or say or, or even say or even say yeah. If, if, you, if you think if you if you played it played it at Alliwell Jones for example, it would have been packed to to the rafters and I, and I know that it would have been sold out and people would have been trying to get still get tickets and stuff like that. But imagine on TV that, it, lo- it loops around. The, there's no the, empty seats. I think the problem every, and it fires the atmosphere. I think terraces fire the atmosphere up. More. I don't know what it is about it, but when stadiums have got terraces rather than seats, um, it fight, it ranks that it, it, it does it does something to I the think, atmosphere. I think the problem you've got is if you look now at the games that rugby league's holding at big stadiums, full of empty seats. The cup, Challenge Cup final at Wembley, the Grand Final at Old Trafford obviously has less empty seats, but still empty seat. Magic Weekend at St James Park full of empty seats. Anfield's going to be full of empty seats. So. It's not attractive. You miss one out. You miss Bloomfield Road. Black. It's not. It's not attract. <laughs> it's not attractive to fans and sponsors to do it. Whereas if you held it at Warrington or St Helens or you know, and I'm not just saying this because this is Ireland team. If London got themselves together and there was a stadium, you know, I went to Australia, New Zealand, in the Tri Nations at Twickenham Stoop years ago, and that was one of the best games of rugby league I've ever seen. And it was a packed house there, and it was great, a really good atmosphere. I think you'd be much, it's much better for the product if you get it in one of these grounds, pack it out, and just make it look amazing. Because that's what you're going to get people behind. Whereas at the moment, it's a bit like we're going, you know, we're almost like trying to be a big sport without actually being one. And you go into Anfield and you're almost like wasting well, the opportunity because yeah. they're going to go to Anfield. And, and uh, you know, they're taking it to Anfield and people are probably going to be a bit underwhelmed because it's not packed out. And the you atmosphere know, and, is going to be echoey. Yeah, and it's yeah. just like, you know, for me, you know, obviously someone will have the statistics more so than me. How many people are going to Anfield that are going, that would go, wouldn't go if it was at St. Helens or at Warrington? And, you know, I don't think it's, I, I can't imagine it's a massive, you know, a massive number. I think, I think the, I don't, I don't, it's you've the got to make it's, the pro- You've got to make the product desirable. And at the moment, it's not like, I, you know, if you... If you How do you make it desirable, though? But, but you make it desirable by having it, make it brilliant at Warrington. You know, make, or St. Helens, make it sold out there. You make it... 25 quid, 30 quid a ticket. Sell it out at Warrington or St. Helens. Two days, it's too much. And, but it's not, though, Drew, it's because easy. it's 24 quid to get in at Wakefield. How can you well, charge? Well, that's, that's too dear. Far too dear. But, that's why they only get four thousand in the. Well, yeah, but that's gates. fine. But that's what they're charging. So it's like so you it's can't say. It's you can't dear. say. It's not. That's if you want. If, if a you family of four wants to go to a game, it's hundred quid. I, yeah, but kids aren't. The kids don't pay that full price. To 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 be honest, I think rugby league needs to get its pricing structure right across the board. Well, yeah, it does. I mean, we've 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 heard. You know, in football, I know they can afford to do it because they've got lots more sponsors, the TV deals out of this world in comparison to any other sport. It sucks resources from every other sport and limelight. But they talked about 20 quid for get in, didn't they? The, the price in rugby league is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like, it's, it's 18 quid to watch Swinton. 
it's 24 quid to go to Wakefield and it's just like what is that all about it's Wait, 20, I think 20 quid for Super League is probably more than enough at the moment I could understand it if everyone was selling out every week but they're not well you so can pay 2 or 3 quid and go watch in a decent standard of like National Conference mm-hmm. League level rugby league yeah, and, you know, well, not, every, not everyone can afford 24 quid for it just go to a, a bog standard Super League game what do you reckon but that's fine I mean that's fine but not everyone can afford to go to the football but people do they still sell out every week and I think you know I, I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that you're wrong I'm not I'm saying that 20 quid I think 20 quid for a Super League game I think that should be the most it is but what my point is is whatever a Super League game is an England game should be more a Grand Final should be more a Challenge Cup Final should be more whereas at the moment it isn't they need to, and they, that's the problem they need to start selling the sport on the, what, what's on and the this field. is what but well, this is they what need, I mean they need to put Ryan Hall's try against for, for example for a Super League trailer next year on Sky or whatever Put, put Ryan Hall's try on when he scored, celebrate the games, put the big hits in. But, we don't do it. We, we, is, instead, we get the Brownlee brothers just uh, put, making players do bleak tests. But this is what I mean with if you have if you make the product brilliant at Warrington or at St. Ellen, you know, you look at Premier League darts as the comparison. They weren't they didn't start off in big arenas. What they did, they were in smaller arenas, they made it amazing, and then that made the bigger arenas want it. And I'm like, I think until you can sell out a test match at Warrington or St Helens or be guaranteed, do it there, and then you want you want Anfield to be knocking on your door saying, "Bloody hell, that looks great! Let's let's have that packed out at Anfield, and then work together to sell it out." Because at the moment, you're not doing anyone any favours because you're going to Anfield, you're going to St James Park, you're going to Old Trafford, you're going to Wembley, and it's just full of empty seats. You're not doing anyone any favours. I'm loving this discussion, absolutely loving it, but I'm afraid that the time is I think it's not countdown so. clock. There's behind you. Well, this one that I'm going to import. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're asking me to be, do a big job here yeah. in post production, aren't you? Um, right, but uh, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that discussion. I think it was it was worthwhile having, wasn't it? What do you think? Uh, remember, you can comment, like, share, get this as far and wide as you can. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Pleasure.